Hello, um, welcome to the lecture on, uh, we're going to learn about uh, AX1, 2, and 3, the 3X structure. Um, by this time, you are probably working, you've already turned in your, um, unpacking your idea. Of course, I'm shoot, or I'm um, recording this a week ahead, so you're probably working on it right now. And I've seen two ideas so far, and it's always fun to see people's ideas and then uh, to see them uh, be executed through the rest of the semester and see how you've developed them. It's really fun to, to see your ideas. So anyway, let's talk about um, screenplay format and story structure. Uh, this is, you know, um, 2210, so it's uh, more simplified than what you're going to have when you go to the five, uh, the 500 class, or I think it's the 5,050... 200? Can't remember. Anyway, so for the three-act structure, we need a beginning, middle, and end. Um, and uh, Act 1 is essentially your introduction. Okay, You're going to introduce the viewer to the world of your script. Uh, the people, uh, the places, the time frame. Um, your first act is all about setting things up. So when you think of when you watch a film, um, it sets it up at the beginning so you kind of know where you're at, who the characters are, what's uh, you don't know what's going to happen, but you know the scene, the tone, the, the setting, the tone, that kind of thing. Um, and remember that we're talking about film, so it's all about images. It's audio and visual together. Um, the best way to begin your intro is with a strong image. Um, I know when I was a television reporter uh, for news, you always, when you shot your B-roll, you always use your best shot to open it up because you want to grab the viewer's attention. And same with film, you want to grab the viewer's attention. Um, uh, and in the first, uh, you know, few scenes, you need to grab the viewer. Uh, if it's uh, if you're at the movies and you've paid for a ticket, you're probably going to sit there through it. Even if it doesn't totally grab your attention, you're probably not going to walk out because you invested some money. But you might not re recommend it, and that's how films really make money, is because people see them and go, wow, and then everybody else sees them and the, the critics review them. Um, so anyway, let's uh, give a little list, and this is on your notes, um, what you should accomplish in your introduction in your Act 1. Uh, you should introduce your main characters. You should establish your primary environments, the different settings, convey some kind of mood or some kind of atmosphere, so in um, True Grit, uh, we knew right away uh, that it was a Western, that it was out West. It's the Wild West. We all know that feel. We knew it was in the 1800s because there were buggies and they were dressed like that. They had uh, holsters with guns on. People don't really generally do that anymore. Uh, we knew the main character was a young girl, uh, an old guy who was a drunk. That was John Wayne. And then Glenn Campbell's character was a younger uh Texas Ranger. Um, so that was the atmosphere was uh, kind of the Wild West. Uh, the things seemed kind of uh, loosey goosey, you know. Um, there was a hanging at the beginning, which is not something we're used to, and a bunch of people watching it like it's a an event. Um, so that was definitely it was all the Wild West atmosphere. Um, we established the time period, we already said 1800s, we don't know exactly when. Uh, we illustrate a routine or a way of life, a Wild West town, um, where there, uh, it's small, it's a lot of people that came from the East and established here, and the people that came from the East weren't the buttoned up types, they were the types that uh, wanted adventure, so it was a, a specific kind of profile of a person that would live in a Wild West town. Uh, you provide a relevant backstory, what happened before the story be began, and we learn that Maddie Ross's father was killed, and that's what uh, happened before. We don't get to see that. Um, and you inter introduce the antagonist, and the antagonist, we get introduced to him, but we don't meet him right away. We hear about him um, more than um, we, you know, in the introduction. We hear about this bad guy that Maddie Ross is after. Okay, so within your first act, um, for you guys it's going to be in your first five pages, um, you're going to have to accomplish all of this in your five pages, 
and then you're going to need an inciting incident. And this is the incident that gets your story moving, okay? Otherwise, it's boredom. Something that's going to kick off the story, the conflict. Uh, what do your characters want? What might prevent them from getting it? So we know Maddie Ross wants uh, to find the guy that killed her father, and she wants to um, uh, set the record straight and uh, kill him. Um, she wants justice. Um, the inciting incident occurs when the action plunges the character into conflict. The conflict is Maddie Ross needs to get this guy, and she's 14, and she's a girl in that uh, culture. Um, she was pretty powerless, although she didn't appear to be, did she? Um, but um, she needed to find somebody that knew the area that could help her um, get the bad guys. Um, the inciting, uh, so we, we pl it plunges the character in conflict, um, a piece of critical information arrives, a sequence of small events prepares the audience for the story. Okay, so we see um, this all coming together for Maddie Ross, um, little events, she's in the, her hotel room and she's looking at her dad's stuff, she goes and sees him in the casket, so now she's getting angry, and she loves her father. Um, we see John Wayne, who's a drunk, and he's a federal marshal, I believe. Um, and we see he knows how to handle a gun and would be probably somebody that could help her. So we see all that coming together, okay? Um, plot point, point one occurs at the end of the first act. So this would be probably on your fifth page. Uh, not probably, but would be on the fifth page of your introduction. It pushes the action in a new direction, okay? It forces the protagonist to make a choice and take a risk. It raises the stakes. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through all of this, and then we'll go back, and we're going to I'm going to uh, talk about True Grit and where it was in each one because that way um, you can understand from an actual film. That's why I had you watch it this week. Okay, Act Two creates a snowball effect with your action. All of a sudden, things start happening one after another. One moment adds to the next and the next until the action goes to a culminating event. It's twice as long as the first act, so it's going to be 10 pages. It can be difficult to keep the story going in an interesting manner. This is the play, the part where the where movies often lag and drag if they go on too long. Um, so it can't be too short, but it can't be too long where all of a sudden it's dragging. And the movie that we watched last week, uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, one of the questions I asked you in uh, the discussion was, is there anything you didn't like about this film, or is there anything that could have been done better? I think something to that effect. I love the story, but I felt it really dragged in the middle. I think it could have been a lot shorter. So that was what I wanted to see if you'd pick out, uh, that it dragged. Um, and I haven't seen it since last year or last semester, so I can't pick out a specific spot, but I, that was um, one thing I felt like um, it had an issue with that. So you don't want your middle to drag. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, make the conflict personal so people relate to it. Um, and again, remember those universal feelings uh, that we all feel, passion, hate, love, anger, that's what makes the conflict personal, um, and then personal to the characters. Uh, let the protagonist fail at least once. Um, you know, if the protagonist is successful immediately, then uh, your story's over. You know, the protagonist has to fail, and we see how hard it was for Maddie Ross to uh, uh, get Labeef and uh, Labeouf, Labeouf, it's French, and um, um, John Wayne, um, to let her, let them take her. They didn't want to take her. They wanted to leave her. She was a 14 year old girl. Um, so she, uh, was, you know, adamant that she was going. So we kept seeing her fail. And then there were many failings through the other rest of the film where they did something good and then they blew it. Okay. Allow the antagonist to succeed perhaps several times. Um, Teach the protagonist a new skill. Sorry, my phone. Um, teach the protagonist a new skill. Um, test the protagonist's current abilities and or expertise. Further explore the subplot. So don't forget your subplot. 
your subplot has to develop, has to be interwoven through the entire thing. That's a secondary story throughout. You've seen them in practically every movie. Um, so uh, you want to begin that. So you have to keep that story going while the other one's going. Of course, it's going to be a minor story compared to the main story, but it gives the piece depth, okay, and it's layers. Okay, in Act 2, you must create a snowball effect with your action. Each moment adds to the next. Second act is twice as long as the first. So, in other words, every scene is intentional because it leads to the next scene, okay? All right, so now let's talk about True Grit and all these specifics. So, Act 1, in True Grit, the inciting incident is Maddie Ross wants revenge for her father's death. Ross is trying to get the federal marshal to go with her to hunt the man who killed her father. In the meantime, they discover a Texas Ranger who's also searching for the same guy, and they end up together. Plot point one, which is plot point one, is at the end of Act One, so it's going to be on the fifth page, is when Rooster Cogburn, who was the actor John Wayne, I keep referring, agrees to help Maddie, and LaBeouf goes with them. So that's when all of a sudden the three decide they're going together to hunt um, the guy that killed Maddie's father, Tom Chaney. Okay? Um, so that we know, okay, the next scene is going to be them going and doing this. Okay, so Act 2, they set out on the search together. We see them. The midpoint, so you need a middle point, um, like the middle of the film, is when they meet the two guys in the shack. So they're, they're, uh, they go out, they, t they get a, kind of a rough start because they try to leave Maddie, but then eventually they realize Maddie's not going away. And so then they're traveling and then um, they're encountering nothing at this point. And then the midpoint is when they go to the, that shack and there's guys in there, okay? Um, and one of the guys in the shack uh, says where Tom Chaney can be found. So that we know from here on in each scene is going to be like a snowball effect to getting to this Tom Chaney and seeing what's going to happen with him. Um, the midpoint is between the second act. It's in the middle. So if your uh, piece is um, 20 pages, which it is, about at about 10 pages is when you're going to have the middle, okay? This provides structure in the part of your story that is the longest, okay? Because remember, your act two is the longest, and you don't want it to drag like the boy who harnessed the wind. Yours probably won't because it's very short to begin with, but um, uh, that's going to be the point where it's the middle. And from then on at the midpoint, we know the action is going to be really going to uh, reach the climax. Okay. Your protagonist needs a personal stake in the conflict. In True Grit, the main character is avenging her father's death. The main character is um, the other main character, which is Rooster Cogburn, John Wayne, the main, is getting a drunk, okay, she's getting a drunk um, person to help avenge her father. Um, so he's drunk and seems like he's his career is over. He might have been some big shooter, you know, in the... In previously in his younger life, but uh, are we convinced that this is going to be a successful union between Maddie and John Wayne when he seems like he can't even stay sober? Um, so that's a conflict that we see right away. Hmm, are they going to be able to get Tom Chaney? Um, then the other guy that joins them is the LaBeouf. Um, he's a Texas Ranger, and she and Maddie meet at the boarding house, and they don't seem to get along at all. So we're thinking, this doesn't seem like this little threesome of people is going to work out. So we have conflict right away about, okay, yeah, they're going to find Tom Chaney, but are the three of them even going to be effective? Um, and uh, then uh, the main character, um, what does she learn? Um, her achieve, her goal of, a, of her avenging her father's death. Sorry. What does the main character learn to help her achieve her goal of avenging her father's death? And true grit, she's not going to give up even though they don't want her to go with them. So what has she learned? She's learned she is has true grit. She's going to go. She's going to avenge her father's death no matter if she's a young teenager. Or she's a woman in a culture where women were more subordinate. Um, and she's going to do it. And so she does not take no for an answer when um, Rooster Cogburn and LaBeouf try to uh, leave her behind. Um Okay. 
So uh, talking about the scenes again, remember I talked about each scene needs to build on the next scene. So it's a snowball effect, okay? So your story might drag if you have scenes in there that don't mean anything. I know last semester, this is the third time I've taught this class, there would be a scene in somebody's screenplay and it really, maybe they wanted to have that scene, but it had no bearing on the story. So those have to go. Each scene has to lead to the next scene. Each one has to be very intentional. Okay? Um, create actions so poignant, so shocking, so revealing that it demands a quick response. So each thing has is, is pointing something out. So in the scene where they're in the shack, and there's those two guys in the shack, it seems like it starts out relatively... Um, uh, benign, you know, uh, these seem like a couple of goons that, you know, are bad guys, but they're kind of lesser bad guys, and they squeal kind of where Tom Chaney could be, and then um, everything goes awry, and they both end up dead. So it's like, whoa, what just happened there? These guys are dead. They just killed them. So um, we know that this is really, the story is starting to speed up, and now um, they're really invested in this mission and they just killed two people and now they're going to go right to where Tom Chaney is. Okay. Um, another film that I thought of when I was um, putting this together was Indiana Jones. Um, how, you know, the tone of the Indiana Jones movies are very fast moving. Every scene has so much um, uh, suspense and passion and action in it that you're like breathless by the time you get done. Like I think of when the Indiana Jones, the first one, when that boulder is chasing him. I don't know if you've seen it. And you're just like, oh my gosh, that. And then the next thing he's stuck in a room where the walls are coming in and there's spikes and there's skeletons everywhere. And it's just like one scene after another, you're just exhausted. Um, so that's what, that's one where, um, you know, you're on the edge of your seats as each scene. Now, of course, True Grit does not fit into that category. It moves much slower, but that's just a good example of um, the, a real extreme um, example of one scene building on the next. Okay, uh, at the end, uh, in Act 2, um, so we're in our 10 pages, the end of Act 2 is going to be your plot point 2, so that would be page 15. Okay, it comes at the end of the second act and drives the story to the resolution. Okay, um, in True Grit, plot point two, where it drives us to the resolution, is Maddie meets Tom Chaney at the river. Okay, remember, she goes down to the river, and who's down there? Tom Chaney, the person they're looking for. So we know, okay, things are going to start to really speed up and finish this off now, because now they've been searching for this guy, she's wanting to avenge her father's eyes, and now here she's standing face to face with him, and she shoots him. So that takes us to Act 3, okay? Will my pr protagonist succeed? Is Maddie going to succeed? Maddie is captured by the bad guys and they're holding her hostage. So what happens? She shoots him, but then she gets captured. So, you know, uh, in a twist of irony, she has to stay with her father's murderer, who she has wounded, but who also has captured her, and the two are left behind by the bad guys. So the other two take off, leave her there with the guy she's been trying to find, and he's holding her hostage. So it kind of totally backfired on her. She did get to, she shot him, but she didn't kill him. So we don't know how this is going to work out, okay? Um, at the beginning of Act 3, the protagonist faces the upward hike or the downward sprint to the most gripping moment in the script, which is our climax. So we, that's where we, at the end of Act 3, so on your page 16, we should be, um, your protagonist either is going to, um, Crash and burn or be victorious, depending on how you want to write your story, okay? And it's going to be a lot of excitement in that last five pages, okay? So one of the following would generally happen. The protagonist abandons hope and must be inspired back to action. So we see Maddie is in a snake pit, and we're like, eh, I don't think she's going to make it. I think this is going to be a bust here. Uh, the protagonist makes a breakthrough discovery. The protagonist acquires a final necessary skill. I thought of the movie Karate Kid for that. Um, so these don't all apply to True Grit. These are just different things that might happen with your protagonist, not all of them. Um, the villain forces the hero into combat. Uh, Maddie throws hot water on Chaney's face and runs from him. Okay, so that would be that. The protagonist overcomes an internal obstacle that enables him to fight a physical 
antagonist. Uh, that's maybe somebody that doesn't maybe have confidence and suddenly they get a second wind and they beat the crap out of their physical antagonist. Um, uh, and it might not even be a physical antagonist. I think of the beautiful mind where the antagonist was his schizophrenia. And um, John Nash learned to, when he saw the invisible, or not the invisible, the, um, well, yeah, the imaginary characters that his mind was conjuring up, he realized they weren't real and he acknowledged, okay, they're not real. I might see them. Nobody else does, but they're not real. Um, so he found uh, it within himself to um, be able to live with that um, uh, mental issue. Um, I don't know if you've seen that movie. I, I think I mentioned it last week. It's a really good movie. Okay, so now we're in the last five pages where things are really getting exciting. Um, this is the climax, which is going to be the highest point of your story. Uh, it's your script's final bat battlefield and represents the most intense and largest scene of the film in which the protagonist attempts to achieve his or her goal. Okay, uh, Maddie's goal is to get Tom Chaney dead, right? Um, so we're not sure. She's in a snake pit. She just threw water at him. Uh, LaBeouf and um, Rooster Cogburn are there with her. They've got to find her. Okay, Rooster Cogburn ends up facing the four bad guys alone in a shootout. Rooster is injured and three of the bad guys are killed. Okay, so then now the main bad guy is also wounded and he and Rooster face off. Maddie falls into the snake pit and Tom Chaney has her by gunpoint and then Rooster kills Chaney and res rescues Maddie as she is dying and he races to get her to the doctor. So a lot of intense action going on there. We don't know. First of all, is Rooster Cogburn going to be killed? Because now he's it's one against four. Is Maddie going to be killed in the snake pit? Is um, Maddie going to die of the snake wound? You know, she gets rescued by Rooster, and now we think, is that going to be it? We, we don't know. So when creating your climax, keep these points in mind. Your char character needs to be an active participant. I think that goes without saying, but we'll say it. Your villain should be equally formidable, um, meaning it's got to be like a villain, whatever the villain is. If it's a, uh, like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. It can be nature, um, you know, it can be... Uh, you know, an internal struggle. Uh, it can be sci-fi, um, you know, someone from outer space, whatever. Okay. Um, so anyway, your character should be an active participant. Your villain should be equally formidable. And something personal is now at stake. Okay. What's personal at stake? In this case, Rooster ends up really caring for Maddie. And he doesn't want her to die. He wants to take care of her. Um, there should be little time to think the scene should really boom, 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 boom. And we know that from watching film, that the the um, act three usually goes quite quickly. Something unexpected should occur, should occur. In this case, Maddie falls into a snake pit and is injured, and LaBeouf dies. LaBeouf, LaBeouf dies, which we didn't expect, and, uh, you know, I didn't really like that. You know, I thought maybe she and Maddie were going to get together. Um, he and Maddie were going to get together. They didn't. He died, so that was kind of unexpected. Your character should use some acquired skill in his or her attempt to succeed, and Maddie's was strictly the grit, where she wasn't giving up. You should answer the central question, which for most stories is, will your protagonist succeed in achieving his or her goal? So we know the protagonist's goal was to get Tom Chaney, and at the end we see her bitten by a snake, dying, and we're wondering, is she going to die um, Tom Chaney has been killed, but is she going to get the satisfaction of knowing that? So you want to create a few surprises, impediments, turnarounds, or miscalculations to make the character think on his or her feet. So, of course, this was happening throughout this film. Okay, your resolution, which is after your climax, so it's going to be this high point, and then what's your last scene? Uh, it goes quickly. It's not some long, drawn-out thing, because we've already reached the pinnacle of the film. Uh, don't linger on it. You'll notice the movie usually ends shortly after the climax. Suggest a future life for the protagonist. Uh, illustrate the repercussions of the the repercussions of the climax. In this case, LaBeouf is dead. He died, and he's buried in Texas. Uh, establish any changes in the protagonist. Uh, Rooster is a changed man. He's softened, and Maddie loves him as a friend. Um, and she uh, even 
um, the last scene, she says she wants him to be buried in her family plot. So we, the subplot in this film is the relationship between those two. Um, how it ends up, it starts out antagonistically, and then they become really endeared to each other. Um, and that is the subplot of this. Um, and you might uh, suggest, depending on your film, a just or an unjust world. Okay. Movies uh, need subplots, so we're going to talk about subplots. That's your second story um, that's going to run throughout. Um, movies need subplots to give them depth. The subplot in True Grit is the relationship Maddie has with the two men, especially Rooster Cogburn. They begin antagonistically and transform to mutual affection for each other as the movie progresses. Um, so think about your subplot. What subplot? What setup does your subplot require? What is your subplot's central question? Just like doing your plot, you just do it the same way. It's just a secondary story. What is the inciting incident that starts the action? What obstacles do the subplot characters endure? How do they answer the central question? Um, meaning, are they going to achieve their goal? Should crisscross main plot at pivotal point? So you bring the, the plot, the subplot, and it's kind of always interceding where it's developing at the same time. Express the story's theme and offer opportunities to witness change in the protagonist, Okay, which we did with Maddie and with Rooster. Okay, so now I want to go through this very simple couple fairy tales that I'm sure you've all heard of and uh, divide them up into these different parts of film as well to help you to understand the concepts. So let's talk about the story, the fairy tale Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, so Act 1, we're setting, remember Act 1 is the setup. Jack and his mother are so poor that she instructs him to sell, to sell their last cow for money or food. That's the setup. The inciting incident is Jack meets a man who claims he has magic beans, and Jack trades the cow for those beans instead of money or food. Uh-oh, the mother's not going to be too happy about this. The central question, will Jack find a way to provide for his family? He just did something kind of dumb. Is that going to help? We'll see. Plot point one, which is at the end of Act One, enraged that Jack has returned empty-handed, his mother tosses the beans out the window. She's mad and she throws the beans out and she's really mad at Jack. They grow into a beanstalk overnight. Okay, that's your inciting incident. A beanstalk and it's huge. What is that going to mean? Is Jack going to be victorious? Is he going to feed his family? So now we go to Act Two, the longest part. Um... The midpoint of Act 2, after successfully stealing, so Jack, the Act 2 starts with Jack wakes up, he sees the beanstalk, he climbs it, he's up there into another kingdom or world, and there's a giant that lives there, and he sees the giant has lots of money, and he has a golden egg. So at the midpoint, the middle of half, after successfully stealing the giant's golden egg, Jack returns to the castle to go after the bag of gold. So he steals the golden egg successfully, and then he's like, hey, I'm going to get some more gold. That's the middle point. Okay, he still has to get out of there. Plot point two, Jack tries to steal the magic harp, but it sings a warning and the giant wakes up. Uh-oh. So now, um, looks like Jack has gotten all these this riches, but is he going to get out of this giant's kingdom alive so he can go home and feed his mother? Okay, so this is where the action heats up now because the giant's awake. Um, the climax uh, the giant chases Jack down the beanstalk. Jack chops the beanstalk down with an axe. The resolution, the giant perishes in the fall. Jack and his mother live a prosperous life thereafter. And Jack has learned a life lesson about theft. <laughs> and he took a lot of risks. And he should have just sold the cow. Okay, let's talk about Snow White, if you know that story. Act 1. Snow White lives in a castle with a mean stepmother uh, who is a queen, and she's very vain. She thinks she's beautiful, and she looks in the mirror every day and says, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of us all? And Snow White is very sweet, and she's beautiful, and the queen is jealous. The inciting incident is the magic mirror says Snow White is the fairest in the land, and the stepmother wants her done away with. The, the magic mirror says Snow White is more beautiful than the queen, and so the queen can't stand it, and she wants to get rid of Snow White. So that's the end of Act 1. It's that plunge the action forward about how's the queen going to get rid of Snow White. The central question, will Snow White escape her stepmother's evil ways? Is Snow White going to survive the evil stepmother? That is the central question. Okay, plot point one. Uh, this is the end of act one. The evil stepmother orders the huntsman to take Snow White to the woods and cut her heart out and bring the heart back. So, okay, that's the plot point one. 
It's going to go into plot Act 2. What's going to happen? So Act 2, Snow White, the Huntsman ends up letting Snow White go away because he can't bear to cut her heart out. And then she's alone in the woods all by herself. Um, and she, the midpoint, she finds a home in the middle of the forest. And it's the home of um, the seven dwarfs who live there. Uh, plot point two at the end, and they like her, and she starts cleaning for them, and they have this little happy little home. Um, plot point two, which is the end of act two, is uh, they go off to work, they're woodcutters, and uh, they leave Snow White home alone. Um, of course, the queen has magic powers, and she finds out where she is, and she transforms into an old lady with poison apple. Um, so that's the climax. The climax is the old lady who's really the queen knocking at the door, disguising herself as, um, you know, as a very old lady. And she says, do you want an apple? And she gives it to Snow White and it's poison and she kills Snow White. The resolution is the prince comes, kisses Snow White and brings her back to life and they live happily ever after. Okay. So those are just two very simple stories that you can divide up into those parts. So I think it'll help you when you're writing your script uh, to be hitting those marks. Uh, with your story, okay? So make sure you are, that you're thinking of your five pages of Act 1, ten pages of Act 2, five pages of Act 3. Uh, Act 1 is going to have your inciting incident and your plot point 1, okay? Which might be the same thing. It's going to be tipping the action over into plot point, or um, uh, Act 2, which is going to be the body of your story, and there's going to be a true middle, at the true middle, things are going to start heading to the climax, and they're probably going to start snowballing a little bit more, okay? At the end of Act 2 is your plot point 2, which is going to tip it over. It's going to be right leading up to the climax. And then Act 3 is going to be the climax and the resolution. The resolution is going to be short. It's kind of your afterglow of the climax, okay? All right, that's it. Um, look forward to seeing your work.